proved out to be a girl. So we have one daughter, Annette, and eight sons. Have nine children, they're all healthy and happy. And uh, I think we have about 13 grandchildren. Some of them is adopted and and whatnot, two, two, three adopted grandchildren. But we are, we're proud of our grandchildren. And you know, uh, I thought I was doing great when I got to be grandpa, but somehow or another it changed over and now I'm great grandpa. I have two great grandchildren. And I guess I, I'm going to check the records again and see. I think I'm older than 66, but <laughs> that's the best I can get out of it. <laughs> so, so much for that. That's, that's uh, kind of in my life up that's to that. great. Now, I'm going to take back just a little bit, if right. you don't mind, to that's that old-timey right. cook stove you said you went to buy, you and your right. wife. And uh, how much did you pay for that cook stove? Do you remember? Paid uh, $3 for it. Who'd you buy it from? From... Uh, It's hard to remember his name now. That's all right. I just thought maybe you just pulled off. That's no. No, I can't remember his name just That's now. Right. But, but you paid three dollars for that. Right, paid three dollars for it. Well, three dollars too was hard to come by back. Then. Oh, I didn't pay cash for it. You didn't? No. Uh-uh. No, I had to had a chance to pay, you know, uh -huh. well, pay him some now and then finish paying for it later on. That well, was the deal. Well, that goes on this day and time. Right? <laughs> That's true. We still on the. All right. You mentioned the fact too about you being a good mule driver. Yes. Sir. Now I'm gonna ask you something about the old timey <laughs> mule drivers that you remember seeing when this building 18 up there. Would you tell me a little bit about that sitting up on the bank or watching them? Oh yes, they are. Before we had 18, we had what was called the Burke Road. It was a dirt road, dusty and. Uh, they started building 18 from Wilkesboro to Lenoa. I was very small, but I remember Bud Gibbs set up what they what we always called a good road camp. Uh -huh. There were a lot of people there from South Carolina, and they had these mule drivers. Uh -huh. And these men was able to take a whip, a leather whip, uh -huh. and they drove uh, a six-team mule driver, a loading wheelers. Wheeler was a, a big scoop that they would load dirt in. It had two handles to it and two wheels on it. Mm -hmm. And one man would get between these handles and, and hold it and let the blade of it dig into the earth. And these mules had what they called a snatch team. Mm -hmm. And this team only had a, a double tree with a big hook on it. There was a chain between these front mules. and they were, To load that scoop, they hooked this snatch team mm -hmm. on between that and they'd pull it with, with six mules. They'd dump it with four, but they'd pull it out with six. And uh, that way they were able to have power to load the wheeler. And these men, were they had songs that they'd sing when they got to load that wheeler. I can't remember what it was now. But they would sing a song when they got ready to load that wheeler. They would load it, and then uh, they would sing, and then they would hit their mules with that whip. And they could strike across these two teams and hit that mule on the other side and not hit these two. That's just how good they was with the wheel. They had them mules trained where they could talk to them just almost like talking to humans. And right. uh, as right. as all right. Right. if they seen a mule now, we am talking about that whip. If they right. seen a mule it was slacking off a little bit, that's what right. that that's was what, what the whip was for, to make him carry his part right. of the load. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to clear up. I right. knew about it, but for the benefit of the tape, I wanted to clear that part. That's right. This mule was supposed to pull equal. They had yeah. what they called in a double tree. Right. And then two single trees on the end of that. Uh -huh. And then this, this double tree had to stay even. Right. If one mule didn't pull his part, then the double tree would drop back, and that would make the load pull uneven. So these mules had to pull even to make the load come out right. And I had the experience with what they call a triple tree. Triple now, tree. a triple tree. Now, they used three. That was what they plowed with. Oh, okay. In the rough land where it was hard earth, uh -huh. they would use a triple tree. Now, a triple tree was longer than the double tree. Yeah. And they would hook, well, say if they had one heavy horse or mule, they would put him in the fur uh -huh. with, a, with a single tree on the end of the triple tree. Uh -huh. And then on the other end of the triple tree, they'd have a, 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 a double tree. Onto, this, onto that, and then two single trees on that. So that gives you three yeah. single trees on a triple tree, on a double tree. 
And who'd have done that then? That would give, they had an advantage, they would offset the pull in the center of the triple tree to where it would balance out this mule, this horse that was in the fur. He'd have the advantage, he'd have more leverage right. on it than the woods two that was on the double tree. So that gives the three about the same pull. That would be working side by side. Right, it? working side by side. Did you ever see any work, uh, say like uh, two side by side and one out front? Did no, you see any of that I never did see that, no. They would have to have special harness just for that, would it? Probably would have to have. It'd be better to go back to the triple tree, wouldn't it? The triple tree was, they, they used this for plowing. Oh, yeah. They might have been a way that, that they would use that other way, but this was the, uh, the basic well, thing. Well, I want to ask you this. You're talking about these mule drivers. Were they black men or white men? Mostly black. Yeah, mostly uh -huh. black. Mm -hmm. well, now, they lived in a camp, or did they? They have... lived in a camp. Uh, when they built these good road camps, they would build a building. Well, I, so as much as I remember, they'd be about a 10 by 12. Uh -huh. And they would just set the planks straight up and down, and they would cover them all shed style mostly. Yeah. And uh, that way, then, when they got ready to move from one camp to another, they would just tear the building down and move. Some slept in tents, but mostly in these little shanty buildings that they would build. Were these all single men, or did you see any families in the group? No, or? they had their families there. They, they just brought their families with them? their families with them and live in the good road camps. Well, they probably lived there, what, six months, wouldn't you? Or where, no doubt, it was because it took a long time. Well, as time long as they took to build the so road, long time to build that road. They just kept moving as the road was built. That's right. As the road advanced, then the camp would move from place to place. That was just, when they finished up with it, that was just a dirt road, wasn't That's it? right. Yes, sir. They had transformed it from a wagon trail to a dirt road. That's right. The, well, the dirt, this was going into uh, to the hard surface. Okay. That's right. This was preparing the 18 for hard surface. Oh, oh okay. That's what, that's what. The, well, what was that hard surface? Was it uh, asphalt or was it concrete? It was asphalt. asphalt. They, um, it wasn't the, uh, the main hardwood like they have. They were the first put down, uh, to my remembrance, they would put down uh, um, tar mm -hmm. and then just mix rock with it. And then that was the way they started out to make it. They didn't have the, the packers like they have today, but as well as I remember, this is how the hard surface road started at that time, was tar and clay and put it down that way. Now I'm going to bring you, if you will, to uh, when did you start into the ministry? Um, well, I've been in the ministry about 22 years now. And... As I, as I started into the ministry, there was a period of a few years there that, that I fought this, and I attribute it to everything to what it really was. I was, I've been in church work ever since I was 11 years old. And I had, well I say, since I was at least say 17 or 18, I have held some type of office in the church. Either a, um, I've come through church treasures of different departments of the church. I was Baptist Training Union president. I was a Sunday school teacher for a number of years. I served on the deacon board for a period of time. Then I, <clears throat> I started being affiliated with the Yakin Valley Association. I, when I started going as a delegate, I say my first time going as a delegate, I was probably about 15 years old, quite well, before I was married. And I began to learn the work of the association. I had the advantage of some because I was able to buy a ride in convenience, truck or car or whatnot, immediately after I got married. And the elderly men that worked in the association, when I was not a delegate, they would ask me to carry them to the association. I'd get to sit in on the sessions. Therefore, I learned a lot about the work of the association as I grew up. Then, as I become to be older, then it come time for to be choose officers in the association, and I was appointed on the for the assistant secretary. I believe was the first 
office that I held in that. And then I was appointed to the association board, I think, if I'm mistaken, I served on that board about seven years. Then from the assistant secretary, I went to the general secretary of the association. This general secretary work, it consisted of writing the minutes. You didn't have any help. You was to keep all the business that was transacted in the sessions for three days and nights. You would keep all that uh, and then compile all this information and place it in the minutes, which is known as the minutes of our association. Going back to this, I, I have been a person that I would consider myself great if I could spell what I can read. But I can read a lot that I'm not able to spell. In taking these minutes, there was a lot of the words that that I would spell them according to sound. I knew it wasn't correct, but I didn't know how to spell the word correct, but I'd spell it according to sound. And then somehow or another, in, in my way of knowing, when I look at the word, I knew what it was, but I knew it wasn't spelled right. I'd go home and sit down with my medicine and take a dictionary. And these words that I'd spelled according to sound, I would spell them out according to the right definition in the dictionary. And that was how that I got the minutes in order that they could go to the press to be printed. And then I compared minutes with the school teacher that made the minutes before I did. But the tactics that I used in making the minutes, then my minutes come out as correct as his, but I, it took me some time to work it out. So this was my way of of doing things and uh, today as far as taking a, a pencil and mathematically counting out a lot of things even into the hundreds of dollars I can put it together within a few cents in my head quicker than I can with a pencil by taking all the larger numbers and putting them together in the next larger numbers and running them together and adding it somehow mathematically in my head. I can't explain it, but I can do it quicker than I can with a pencil. It's wonderful to be able to take a pencil and, and do things right. It's wonderful to be able to sit down, spell all your words correctly. But most of all, you need to be sure of yourself in what you're doing and be yourself. If I try to do like somebody else today, then I'd mess up, but I want to be myself. And whatever I go at, I just want to be myself in it. Not that I'm perfect, no, far from it. Not that I'm what I want to be, no. But I'm just what I am. And I think that's what counts in life, is just being what you are. In talking with you uh, and you telling me things about your past, I realized that you didn't have more than, say, sixth grade formal education. But in looking at your record and where you've come to, uh, that speaks mighty highly because you have come a lot further than a lot of people with degrees, college degrees. Now, I'm not knocking college degrees. It's great if you can get the college degree. That's true. But you've come so far without that degree that this tells me that uh, you got it from actual hands-on experience, didn't you? I mean, you, you Well, did. yes, all I have, it's principally. talking about going to these old people uh, to the meetings and sitting right. in on it. I know experience some, is the best teacher. She's the hardest, but <laughs> she's the best, and isn't she? Well, that's true. But Then, uh, after I had served as secretary of the association for a period of time. Then uh, it come to the organization for moderator. Mm -hmm. And I was chosen moderator of the association. And I've been moderator for 10 years in the association. Now how big a, a territory does this association cover? In the sense of where the counties are, is it in districts or is it in counties? It's in, it's, it's in counties oh, more or less. I'd say Sarah, Idle, Wilkes, Alexander, Caldwell. Um, it's principally 
-hmm. the counties that it's in. It covers five or six counties. That takes in a lot of churches, don't it? Well, it does. There are 17 churches involved in, mm -hmm. in our Missionary Baptist Association. Mm -hmm. And of these 17 churches, they, they're scattered um, in various towns, but we come together then once a year as an associational mm -hmm. uh, annual session. And all of them comes together for the annual session. I'm going to touch on one more thing here now. Uh, where did you, or did you have a job besides the ministry once you got into the ministry? Did you work at, I say, a public work, or did you farm, or what? What was your occupation? I was a uh, furniture worker. I worked at this furniture factory for 34 years. And when I, I was, I, when I was working at the factory, when I was called into the ministry and. Some people says, well, it's on your own choice that you are a minister, but I'm of the strong belief in this, that, that there must be a, a, a God-given call into the ministry. From what I went through with, it, it makes me from, from firsthand, mm -hmm. not from what somebody else said, but I have a firsthand experience to believe they were seven visions that I went to through with before I accepted the ministry. And there is five of them that, that I'll talk to you about. But there was two that was for me. And I don't even talk to my wife about that. No, no, we, we don't want to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> this was for me. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember on a Friday morning that, that I accepted the ministry. I told my, my buddy, I'd worked with him over all these years. We worked side by side for 32 years on the same job. And uh, I told him on this particular morning, I said, the way I feel this morning, I wouldn't feel any worse if my mother was leaning out there in the rain. I wouldn't feel any worse if my mother was leaning dead out there in the rain and nobody wouldn't take her inside. I said, I don't believe I could feel any worse than this. But along about 9 o'clock that morning, that burden rolled off. It was just the same as somebody had rolled a 100-pound weight off of my shoulders. I was rejoicing. I was going around and around in the spray. He said, get out of here, Ma. I said, you ain't fit to work. He said, go on. And I got out. I remember I went over in the shop, and there was a young minister over there. And I went over there telling him my experience that morning. Oh, we just had a glorious time over there. We, we just, there in the furniture factory. He was a, a white minister, and I hadn't met him at that time. It had been about 15 years, but about a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity of going to his church where he pastored and meeting up with him again. And then we embraced one another there in the congregation. It was a great meeting coming back together again. It brought back memories of the things that, that we had talked about on that particular morning. So this is uh, some of my experience of being called into the ministry. Then today I serve as moderator of the association, not from a viewpoint that I never feel like that I can excel anybody in our association. I feel like that any of the ministers, so far as verbal or putting the things together, could do a better job than, than what I'm doing because I'm not there by choice of my own. I'm there because I was a people's choice. And I feel indebted to people for looking up to me with the status that I have educationally wise and choosing me as their leader. I feel I give them the best that I've got and that I feel like they're wise enough when it comes time to make another choice for somebody else, then I'm big hearted enough to serve under the next man just as they have served under me. So I'm not there permanent. I would like to be a living ex moderator. So many times we have dead ex moderators, but I'd like to be one of the living ex moderators. So when the Lord's ready and they're ready, I'm glad to step aside and be a father. I've got uh, one other question. I know your name is Montreal. Hell. Yes, sir. How did you get the name Montreal? It's not something you hear every day. 
It's not a name, in other words, that it ordinary, well, we'll say ordinary people out here will have. You're, you're right. extraordinary. You've got to be, have Montreal for that. <laughs> well, it's a name that you, don't, that you don't hear very much unless it's a ball game. Oh, is that right? Well, they say Montreal. <laughs> I remember I was laying on the couch uh, a few years ago asleep, and I'm, if you call my name, I'm about to wake up, and somebody is playing ball, and somebody called out Montreal, and I wake up and say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, how did it all come about? So we had a large family. I already chose a lot of names, and you know, it used to be before the new baby come, they would buy soap and whatnot to yeah. to bathe the new baby in. But as it come to me, verbal, how I got my name, my father had picked up the cake of the wrapper where the cake of soap was, and he saw the name Montreal on the cake of soap. Excuse me. So he said, "We well, will just name him this." <laughs> So the name is that, but you know, my father had a meager education and my mother and whatnot, and and my relatives and everybody had a problem of pronouncing the name Montreal. They call me Montier. They call me Montreat. And some people call me Monty. They call me everything. So it went on and I got to going out then, and when I got started school, then people would ask me, when I got to school, my teachers first you pronounce it Montreal. Well, I was going out and people would ask me, what's your name? I'd tell them, well, how do you spell it? I'd spell it, and they'd say, well, that's Montreal. Well, I said, I don't know what to do. I said, I'm hung up here with this name, and, and I know they intended for it to be what it spells. And so I said, well, I'll just adopt the real name Montreal, and then I'll have it right. You can call me what you want to, but my name's Montreal. So if you've been used to calling me Montreal, just call me Montreal. If you've been calling me Montreal, that's all right, too. And whatever Montreal or whatever you've been calling me, Montreat, my family doctor, he called me Montreat all the time. Now, that's all right. I'm Montreat to him, but I'm Montreal on the record. So that's how it all come about. So, uh, I, you know, most names, they have uh, a meaning to them. And I carried this name around, and I was never very proud of it because I, well, I, I put out uh, several years ago, if anybody would find a, would name a child after me, I'd buy them a suit of clothes. So nobody was interested in naming their child Montreal. So somehow, my niece got the word out, and she named her little boy that. So I stayed up to my word. I waited he got big enough, and so I bought him a neat little suit of clothes. I went and bought and gave it to him. So I kept my word. As my father said, my word was my bond. I bought the suit of clothes, and so I did that. So, uh, but I was wondering about what my name meant and what meaning it had to it. I was in Lenore in the doctor's office, and the nurse come out to relate something to me, and she called my name. And there was a man sitting there that I'd never seen before. He looked around at me and said, uh, so didn't she call you Montreal? I said, yeah. She, she said, well, I'm from Montreal, Canada. He said, you know what the meaning of your name is? I said, no, I don't know. He said, well, your name means a strong mountain. And that made me feel a little bit better when I found out that, that my name meant a strong mountain. I began to muse in my mind that if rigidly I could build my character to be outstanding like a mountain. You know, a mountain is something that is there. Every time you look, it's there, it's the same. You don't wake up in the morning and find a mountain that one day and a hill the next day. It's a mountain. When the storms come, it's still a mountain. They may be some growth in the storm broke up and taken away, but as nature goes on with the mountain, it still holds its antiquity, it comes back. If you break, cut down one big tree on the mountain, as time goes on, another tree will go back in the place of it. I wondered in my life, as failures and things come in my life, if I could measure up to the strong mountain in my life, Mount Royal in Canada, Stand, uh, Montreal stands at the foot of Mount Royal. 
there's a beautiful clear lake. He told me if I ever come to Kennedy, he wanted me to go fishing with him in that lake. That was a temptation to go to Kennedy, just to go fishing. But he said that you could stand in the edge of Montreal and look at this lake and see the reflection of Mount Royal on the other side. He told me I had a good name, so since that time I've been a little prouder of my name. So that's uh, so far as I'm concerned. That's, that's the story behind my name. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to take your glasses off. I would like to get a, a clear shot of your face without the reflection yeah, or the light. That's great. Just hold on right there, please. This is for the record down the road. Uh, you look mighty fine. I certainly appreciate you taking your time to talk to me. And it's like we had talked before, you know, I, I told you that uh, you were giving me the most precious thing in the world you could give to me was your time. Thank you. And uh, and I greatly appreciate this, and I assure you, a lot more pre a lot more people appreciate it too. Do you have anything else that you would like to talk to me about right now? Oh, uh, you... just one thought. Yeah. May I put my glasses. Yes, sir. You sure. Just can. one thought for the for the future oncoming generation. Um, regardless as to where you are in life, then make the best out of what you have. Many times we, we, we brood over because I don't have what somebody else has. But remember that, as has been just now said, your time is the most precious thing that you have. So make use your time wisely. Yeah. I remember here in this particular church, I was asked to preach on an ed educational day on one occasion, and then I informed people not by where I would really like to be, but where I am and how to make the best of where you're at. In life today, we find many people that they're, they're brooding so much over what they don't have, they don't have time to be thankful of what they do have. Today, I would, uh, I would like to have uh, a high school education. And sometimes, and it gets stronger, that I am uh, anticipating going back, getting my high school diploma. 